This is our basic plan for the day. We're going to have a very, very brief overview of some of the literature in uh, exercise in ASD, community recreation, and swimming, and that'll help you understand why I did this project, why I chose to do this research. And then I'll talk to you lots about my research, lots of the details of the, the data and our, all of our findings, and then briefly discuss some potential directions for future research. Um, I have lots of people to thank, so all the people who participated in my research, all the swimming instructors and the families. Also, I had um, volunteer research uh, assistants who are students at Capilano do lots of the filming for me, which I'm very thankful for. My research assistant, uh, my dissertation committee, and also my funding sources. Okay, so to begin, uh, we'll just talk briefly about physical exercise and ASD. At this point, it's actually quite clear in the existing literature that individuals with ASD are participating in much lower levels of physical activity than their typically developing peers. That holds true for both children and adults. Um, and we also know that obviously increased exercise is related to some really nice outcomes such as improved physical health um, as well as motor skills, social behavior. Um, there are some good reviews, there's a reference there if you're interested in that. Uh, within participants with autism and looking at all kinds of different outcomes that we've seen uh, when we do physical activity interventions. Uh, community recreation is kind of, I view that a little bit separately. Uh, we also have some uh, nice reviews in the literature about positive benefits for uh, individuals with ASD when they are able to participate in community recreation. So we know there can be benefits for physical health but also mental health and affect. Um, community recreation allows uh, individuals with ASD that chance to, uh, you know, work on their social skills and also potentially to develop some friendships. Um, but up to this point in time, we, there really is not a lot out there about how to facilitate getting individuals with ASD into community recreation in a way that's successful, right? So, so that the community rec centers feel successful and also the individuals with ASD and their families feel like it's a success. Uh, I chose to zero in on swimming for my study um, for several, uh, several reasons. So swimming is really unique because you can do it throughout your entire lifespan. So uh, babies come to the pool with their parents and get used to the water and then we see that right up through um, individuals who are much older. Um, the neat thing about swimming is that you can do it by yourself or you can do it in a social uh, group, in a club, or in a team, or in lessons. And that might be really appealing to some individuals on the spectrum that they, can, they have that choice. They can do it either way. Um, swimming is an essential safety skill, no doubt about it. A uh, recent review in the Association for Science and Autism Treatment showed quite clearly that individuals with ASD are at a much higher risk for drowning than their typically developing peers. Um, swimming is really important to parents, so they want their kids to uh, learn swimming because it's an essential safety skill, but also because they feel it's an activity, a typical activity of childhood, so they want their, their kids to be able to participate. And finally, swimming can be a form of vigorous physical activity. The kids you're going to see today in my study, you know, they're not quite at that level yet, but, <laughs> but it can be a form of vigorous physical activity, so there may be some corresponding health benefits. So uh, when I started to look at swimming in ASD and think about a research project, um, there were very few studies that existed at that point in time. And the interesting thing to me was that uh, a lot of them evaluated using a very specific teaching technique. So um, constant time delay as an example. So constant time delay is a really specific prompting technique where you, know, you wait a certain amount of time and then that's when you provide the prompt. So it's kind of a technical, um, technical teaching procedure or the Hallowick method, which is another sort of just uh, approach to swimming instruction. So sort of looking at different types of swimming instruction. And at that point in time, there were no studies where um, the swimming instructors were actually community swimming instructors. It was always a researcher implementing the intervention. So um, a graduate student who you know had a background in swimming and interest in autism and decided to do a study on swimming. Um, so. Uh, that was really interesting to me because I felt that until we got to the point where we were training community swimming instructors, we, we aren't really building capacity in the community. We aren't really making the kind of difference that I think we could be making. So here's the rationale for my study then. It's important to families. Um, also, when I started contacting community centers, 
uh, they were very interested <laughs> in potential for training in this area because a lot of them said, oh my gosh, we're getting so many more kids walking through the door with autism diagnosis. Most of our staff have no idea what autism is or any ideas about how to support autism. So communities uh, were definitely interested. Um, as I said before, shifting away from sort of uh, having the graduate students do the intervention, but really focusing on empowering community staff instead. Um, and finally, you know, who knows in the future, maybe this will lead to all kinds of different possibilities for more effective access to recreation for kids with autism. So I had three research questions. The first one was really about the training. So I was interested to know um, if I put together an instructional package that included a workshop as well as some in-pool coaching, would that have an impact on the swimming instructors? So would their skills increase? The second question was about, um, so if I taught these swimming instructors some skills, would there be a relationship between increased skills and more um, better swimming outcomes for the kids? So would they be more cooperative? So are they even engaging in the lessons better? Um, but also, does, do they actually learn to swim better? Do they gain more skills if the instruction changes? And then finally, um, these are questions about uh, social validity and ecological validity. So um, what do people think about this? What do the swimming instructors think? What do the parents think? What do the aquatics coordinators think? Um, because if I've got a great intervention, but no one thinks that it's actually doable, or they felt stressed out through the whole thing, then who cares ultimately? So that was important too. So when I went looking for instructors, I uh, initially had a lot of conversations with um, a couple of aquatics coordinators at community pools here in the Lower Mainland. Uh, I was looking for instructors who were fully qualified. These are all uh, criteria specified by rec recreation centers for what people have to have to teach swimming. Um, and, and ultimately, just that they were able to commit to the, the time period for the study. And I, at the end of the day, I had six instructors who participated in the research. So my kids with ASD, uh, I, look, I went out and looked um, with local service providers, so we sent out a recruitment letter. Um, we had 16 families approach us and say they were interested in participating in the study. Um, ultimately, we had to exclude three just because they couldn't commit to the scheduling requirements. These were the inclusion criteria, so I was looking for school-age kids. Um, they had to have a diagnosis of ASD. Uh, I was looking for kids who had a receptive language age of at least two years. Um, just so I knew that they could follow some basic instructions. That was, that was it. Their expressive language didn't have to be that high. Um, I wanted kids who were able to enter the pool independently, so not kids who you know, were afraid of the water, because I didn't want this study to be about you know, getting kids into the water. I wanted to, it to be about teaching kids to swim. And then finally, they had to be kids who were able to tolerate physical prompting, because that was going to be a main teaching strategy that I was going to use with the instructors. And I didn't have to exclude any kids for that reason. So I did some testing in my <laughs> initial visits with the family just to make sure that the kids were okay with that. And none of the kids um, were excluded for that reason. Um, the other exclusion criteria were um, I didn't accept kids to the study who had major problem behavior in community settings, although I didn't have any come to me that, where that was the case. Um, and I didn't accept kids to the study who could already swim really well. <laughs> so kids who could already do uh, the kind of the four main swimming, swimming strokes proficiently, although again, I didn't have any families approach me where that was the case. So, okay. So now I've got my kids with ASD. They were assigned into one of two groups. So we had this thing called the swim group. And these were the kids where we looked at the before and the after. And I'll show you a slide in a second that'll illustrate this a little bit more clearly. So. Um, these are the kids you see in the baseline and then the intervention later when I show you the graphs. We had different kids in the training group. So when the instructors, when I was coaching the instructors in the pool, they worked with different children. Um, so we had six kids in the training group. The reason that number doesn't quite make sense with the one on the previous screen is that we had some kids who initially participated in the study as a swim group kid and then later when it was all done, later they became a train group kid. So that's why it doesn't quite add up. We didn't take data on the train group kids. The train group kids were our, just our teaching kids. We just, uh, they were just met there so that I could, um, just for the coaching, uh, and that's it. Okay. So to, to illustrate that maybe a bit more clearly, um, I didn't have space for all six instructors on this slide. So you have to imagine there were actually five instructors who looked like instructors one and two. 
Um, so they were in one-on-one -on -one lessons, one instructor, one child. Okay, we had a baseline phase, so I didn't bring my laser pointer today, sadly. So here's baseline, one, two, three, four, five lessons. Then we had a training where they, where they worked with me and a kid from the training group, different kid. And then we came back and collected data with the same kid from baseline here in intervention. I wasn't there anymore. They're just teaching and doing their best. Um, we had one instructor in the study who worked with a group of three kids. Five instructors worked one-on-one. -on -one. one instructor worked with a group of three kids. This really came down to a scheduling thing <laughs> with the rec center and the fact that we had this group of three kids who were all really similar uh, come to the study and, and be ready. So those kids were all uh, four to five years of age. They all had quite a bit of expressive language, but they were all, none of them could, I mean, they weren't putting their face in the water, they weren't blowing bubbles. So um, anyway, so those three kids worked together with one instructor. And you'll see later that we collected outcome data separately. So we looked at that instructor with this kid, that instructor with this kid, and that instructor with this kid, because we felt that was important. So the first video I'm going to show you is with one of our instructors one of our kiddos. And what you see here is quite a squirmy kid. So she's very active. <laughs> she moves around a lot. And what I want you to notice about the instructor is um, a lot of the instructions are in the form of a question. So can you do this? Can you show me this? Um, that sort of thing. Uh, and we're really kind of following the child here. So she's kind of dictating what's going to happen. Okay, so that was, do you know how to blow bubbles? Let's blow bubbles together. So the kid really is behaving as though she doesn't know what's going on, right? It's kind of like, here's this person who's got me in the water. I'm squirming, I'm trying to get away. There's not a lot of predictability for her about what's gonna happen in the lesson. So off she runs. <laughs> Okay, so she's taking the instructor's goggles here. She's just looking at them, playing with them, putting them on her feet. The instructor's behind her. Like, she's kind of just really doing her own thing in the water here. This kid is very, very comfortable in the water. She would frequently just swim away, and we'd almost have to grab her because she'd just start going, like, sputtering. So she said, do you want to put them on? Hmm, maybe. Oh, we'll see. Do you want to look underwater? So now she's like, okay, let's forget the goggles. Let's see if I can get her to bowl her bubbles. So there's a directive. We're going to kick over and say hi to mom. So now she's going to grip onto that underwater table thing. <laughs> and the kid really does not, what's really striking to me when I go back and watch this is that she, she just doesn't know what's happening. I mean, she's just kind of making her own decisions here because there's, um, this is all very new to her in terms of having this real instruction in the water. The instructor is trying a lot of different things to get her engaged. Do you want to try it? Like maybe? Huh? Do you want to try? So now she's just sick of hearing it. The kid is just sick of it, so she just starts screaming at her. Okay, let's go kick to mom. So then at the end here she says, no, don't kick me, you're supposed to kick the water. <laughs> so that wasn't too fun. There's another kiddo, very different kid, um, a boy, and uh, has quite a lot of language, but it's really disorganized, you'll see. Sometimes he spits out sentences and his word order is kind of confused. 
Um, and he was just afraid, like really afraid of, um, you'll see in a second, of leaving the wall and, and going into the pool. Put the marshmallows off the wall. Is that here? Not here. Oh, here. These are called marshmallows in pools. I don't, I don't really know why. <laughs> So he got him to hold on to the wall and try to lift his legs, but now he's trying to get him to actually come out with him. And again, here's a kid who's really resistant because there's not there's no predictability in this lesson for him. So it's kind of like the instructor sort of says something and he sort of refuses. The instructor tries it a different way, he sort of refuses. So I don't want to go swimming. That's enough. <laughs> You're in a pool. That's what we're supposed to do here. That's the whole idea. Look around. So he's now trying to hide behind the ladder. <laughs> And he, the instructor is really trying here. He's like, look at the turtle, huh? Isn't this fun? He says, are you having fun? The kid says, no. So he's done a smart thing here where he's brought out some interesting things and he's trying to get the kid to, you know, just engage with him around those toys. He says, let the frog sink, now try to grab it, which is a skill that he wants the kid to learn. And now he's really terrified. Because the instructor just went all the way under the water, and the implication here is, now I'm going to have to do that. Now he's crying, because he's really sad. <laughs> Poor kid, right? No one is having fun. The instructor is trying very hard. The kid is not having a good time. So, you know... There's no swimming instruction. There's nothing, right? There's nothing going on. So we had lots of nice room for improvement with, with both of the kids. So back to our uh, independent variable. Uh, so for my study, this was, as I said before, a staff training workshop as well as some uh, live coaching. So the workshop was about three hours long. Um, and all of the instructors who participated in the study got a total of two and a half hours of coaching from me, meaning that um, initially in the water, uh, really hands-on, modeling um, a lot of things with them, such as like you know how to do physical prompting, how to fade a prompt, how to give a really clear instruction. Um, you'll see in a second the different skills that were taught, but how to interact with that visual schedule, really hands-on, hands-on. And then over time, trying to fade that out so that by the time we got to the end of the training phase, I could stand on the deck and just sort of give occasional feedback to them. Here's a bit more information about the training workshop. So uh, it was a brief overview of ASD. For some of the people, the instructors who participated in the study, this was the first time someone had told them, this is what autism spectrum disorder is. Here are some common characteristics of autism spectrum disorder. Here's what you might expect to see in the pool. Um, and then I described for them uh, each of the seven key skills that I wanted them to use in their lessons, and I'll go over those in much more detail in a minute. Uh, they watched a couple of videos that were not the best, but of me uh, mock teaching a child with ASD um, swimming. And I wanted them to look at what were some of the things that were good in that video and what were some of the things that should be changed in relation to the seven skills. Uh, they could practice some of the uh, instructions, so we tried to generate some examples together. And then finally, we took out the visual supports and um, they got to think about like what might a lesson look like um, for one of their kids. Um, okay, so here are the seven skills that I tried to get the instructors to use in the study. These were um, based on previous literature related to just teaching and autism and what we know to be effective. So. Um, these were the skills that we came up with. And they can be thought of as uh, belonging to several different categories. So the first category is what I called antecedent supports. 
And um, rapport building activities really fits in here. So if you think about the boys who we saw in the video, uh, building some rapport <laughs> was a really nice idea for them because there was just no trust or kind of interest in being there at all. It wasn't a reinforcing environment for that child at the time. So um, rapport building activity is really important. So all I asked the instructors to do was at the beginning and the end of the lesson, do something fun. Second type of antecedent support that I asked them to use was visual supports. So I asked them to actually map the entire lesson on uh, these custom made <laughs> uh, boards. They hung over the edge of the ledge of the pool. Sometimes they fell in, but we tried to use weights to keep them on the ledge. Uh, and they had to show every single activity that was going to happen in the lesson that day. Everything was mapped out. Not only did it have to be prepared and mapped out, they had to interact with it. So before every activity, they had to show the kid, um, okay, now we're going to do this. And when the activity was over, they had to put it away and say, okay, look, next we're going to do this. This is finished. Next is this. Uh, the uh, second category I called attending skills, two things in this category. So first one was arm's length, which is actually really easy to talk to swimming instructors about because they're used to that for <laughs> safety purposes. Um, uh, and I should actually backtrack just for a second and say that some of these skills came from uh, some observations of lessons, some lessons that I watched in the community before the study started, like about a year before the study started, I started walking around and watching people try to teach kids with autism. So be close to the kid before you presented an instruction. An important part of that is I'm going to expect you to follow up with the instruction that you issue, and it's hard to follow up if you're far away. You need to be able to provide a prompt right away. Um, second one here was wait until ready. So if the kid was actively engaged in something else, I don't want you to waste your time issuing instructions to the kid. Um, they did not have to be looking at the instructor because with some of these kids in a busy environment like a pool, we could have waited all day. We could have not issued an instruction the whole time if we waited for them to look. So they just had to have their ears above the water, which was an issue for some of our kids. And uh, they had to not be actively engaged in something else. Third category was instructional skills. So we worked on delivering clear instructions, meaning short declarative statements. So the opposite of a clear instruction is... Um, would you like to show me your bubbles now? The clear instruction would be bubbles, right? Um, so we just worked on that. Uh, a lot of the instructors at the beginning used questions. Can you show me this? Would you like to do this? Um, is it time for this? That sort of thing. Uh, okay, and then three second rule. This is, a, this is really around prompting. So if the child wasn't responding to the instruction within three seconds, I wanted the instructor to deliver a prompt and I wanted it to be a physical prompt. So if you say kick and you're not getting anything, to actually get in there and uh, give the prompt so the child will demonstrate the action, and then you can give the feedback. Good kicking, that's right. Okay. And I introduced all of this in, uh, with the catchy little phrase that I called learning loops. If you know applied behavior analysis, this is just the ABC contingency, right? Antecedent behavior consequence. We just changed it to more community-friendly language. So we called it instruction, action, that's what the child does, and feedback. Um, and help if needed. So help is the prompt. Finally, consequence strategies. Uh, the only consequence strategy we used in the study was praise. So um, I wanted the instructor prov to provide verbal praise to the child um, if they even attempted it. So a little bit more about the coaching. Two and a half hours total. So there were, depending on the instructor and the, really the scheduling of the recreation center, some of them had more training lessons than others, but they all had two and a half hours of my time. So um, the instructors also got written feedback, which um, they gave me really, uh, that they really, really like that. So depending on the scheduling of the lessons, if the instructors were there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they got a summary at the end of the week of the things we talked about. Um, the kids who I had in the study in the fall only had lessons once a week. So they got feedback every time. And they got it right bef like the day before the next lesson so that they could remember, these are the things we talked about last week. Here's what I want you to focus on for this next lesson. So I had research assistants literally on the edge of the pool deck, walking around the edge of the pool, filming. That's why the video isn't perfect, because it's in a real community pool and there's other people there. Um, we coded instructor use of key skills, so a very... <laughs> very complicated Excel spreadsheet where every time the instructor issued an instruction, I would code, was it clear? Did they provide a prompt within three seconds? Did they deliver the feedback? And then we'd code, how, how many repetitions of the instruction did they issue before the child attempted the action?
I coded child skill acquisition uh, into three different categories. Attempted meant um, the instructor tried to do it with the child, but every time they tried it, they, the kid needed a full physical prompt. And finally, we collected measures of social and ecological validity. We had basically um, kind of short questionnaires with one to five scales, and the parents and instructors and aquatics coordinators had to rate various items. 33% of the lessons were also coded by my research assistant, so she did my inter-observer uh, reliability. Um, this was a tricky study to code. We had to be really make sure we got the definitions right, that they were specific, so that we could get that good agreement. So she had a scoring manual. Um, she had examples of what counts as this, what counts as that, what doesn't count. Uh, and we did training with practice, practice tapes um, until she was 90%. We were 90% in agreement. And we also met twice during the study. So we sort of had three cohorts of kids go through the study. Um, and every time a new cohort of kids came in, uh, we would meet again and just sort of make sure that we were still on track, still in agreement. And we didn't, you know, when we coded a tape together, we wouldn't use that in the final inter-observer agreement codings, but it made sure that with these new cohort of kids, we were still coding the same way. Here are the outcomes or the, the data for inter-observer agreement. So uh, there's the seven key skills as well as child cooperation and skill acquisition. Um, you'll see that there's a range for each of the skills, but um, for all of them it was above 80%. The overall mean was 91.2. So we did do some statistical analysis across all six instructors, all eight of the kids who participated on um, a couple of different things. So here's the instructor skill acquisition. Remember, this is across all of the participants. And we saw statistically significant change for clear instruction, three-second prompt, praise, rapport, and visual supports. So for all of those things, um, the instructors increased, and it was statistically uh, significant. What was really interesting is that for these two variables, these two, um, uh, anyway, I'm losing the word. Okay, that's it, attending variables, wait until ready and arm's length, uh, they were present at very high levels during baseline, which to me was honestly not what I was expecting before I did the research. I was expecting people to be far away from the kid and turn instructions, and or for them to feed a lot of instructions to the kid when their ears were below the water or they weren't ready. Um, so this was a surprise to me. Uh, and um, some of it may just have to do with the particular kids we had in the study. Um, some of it may have to do with the fact that these were very keen instructors who already had these skills under their belts, you know, they came to the study wanting to learn more, and they already had those attending skills um, in their repertoire. So, so that's that. So that's let me uh, show you a bit more of the dyad data, so each instructor, each child, which I think is really interesting. And before we do that, I will show you some intervention video. Same instructor, same kid, same skills actually. So you remember in the baseline video, she's trying to get her to put her face in the water, blow bubbles, kick, uh, goggles. and wear goggles. This is still a very squirmy kid. No miracle occurred where her personality <laughs> changed and ta-da, now she's a different kid. What you see in the video is clear instructions, follow through, so <laughs> she says something and she pers the instructor persists until it is achieved, which is great. Um, in the social validity measures, you know, I told you I asked them to like rate these things. Um, and then I had an open-ended section. And uh, of the six instructors who participated in the study, five of them commented, the visual supports we think made the biggest difference for the kids, without me soliciting that. They, they just said, we think the visual supports made the biggest difference. When you watch this video, you see that she really tunes in to seeing the picture and also that structure and predictability within the session is really, really helpful. Um, you'll see a few different ways the visual supports are used. So um, it's definitely now we're doing this and now this is finished and now we're doing this, but also to, um, to offer a choice, which is a nice, uh, a nice use as well. Put face in water. So really clear. Look at her look at the picture, right? Oh, that's what we're doing. Okay. Oh. 
That took too long. I'm swimming away. Same kid. Still squirmy. short instructional units. Blow your bubbles. You did it. Good. Blow your bubbles. You did it. Right? So followed by a little reinforcing activity, right? We're going to sing and do a little song that you like. So she didn't have to do this. She does this a couple times. She says, what is this? Right? She could just say to her, now we're doing this. But, you know, that's okay. So she got it there, goggles. So very predictable, goggles for 10 seconds. This was a total battle for this kid to get her to put the goggles on, their fa on her face. <laughs> so she says the battle of the goggles continues. <laughs> she lost her so she brought her back and reminded her look we're going to do this then this nice thing is going to happen that you like persistence <laughs> whereas before it was do you want to use the goggles no okay We did it. Still very wriggly. <laughs> we'll try that again. <laughs> Looks at the camera. Hi, I'm swimming away. <laughs> You know, you can speculate there. Was she not really motivated by either of those choices? Is that why she swam away? Choice. Well, still, we're going to persist because these are the choices right now. So we get the choice out of her. Out she goes. So here's the last one to compare. So again, she doesn't have to do that. So she throws in the what's this, but she could just say to her, now kicking. That's right. Kicking. Kicking. That's right. My turn. We didn't hear her talk very much at all in baseline. And when we started interacting with her with the pictures, we heard her talk. She labeled the actions, all that. Broke it down. Hold wall. That's the first step. Your turn. Kicking on that. Here. Three, two, one. Yay. So she notices that after she's kicked, she reaches for the mat, so she goes, great, we're going to use that as a, a motivator to get you to do it one more time. Oops, that didn't work. Now the kid is saying, kick, 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 kick. Now reinforcing activity. Yay. Remember last time we tried to get her to kick?
kicked him off? We gripped the table thing. I think that's the end. Now they're going to play. Okay, so same skills, face and water, blow bubbles, kick, um, goggles. Not perfect, right? Still a challenging kid to work with, but much better. Many more instructional uh, trials are happening there where she's getting the practice, really clear instruction, providing better prompts. Still, sometimes it takes her twice to get the kid to do it. That's okay, this is a challenging kid. We're doing way better than we were in baseline. Um, really nice uh, mixing in, uh, here's your activity, or here's this thing I want you to do, now we're going to do this nice thing that you like to do, and making all of it predictable to her. Several times recognizing, I've lost her attention with my verbal blah, 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 blah. So back to the visuals, let's remind her clearly, this is my expectation for you right now, we're doing this and this. And then you get to do this thing. Okay, so let's look at the boys. Okay, so remember, this is the kid who is gripping, <laughs> try, attempting to hide behind the ladder and did not wish to leave the wall. That went on for quite a long time. So he says we're going to start by putting our shoulders in the water. So he forgot to do a fun activity to start. But you'll see what he does here in a second. Just kidding. We're going to do something fun to start. So he remembers. He says we're going to make some cookies. So they usually call this thing a shower, where they dump it on the kids and let it... So he's like, it's really showery, meaning like, what are you doing? Chocolate, put some chocolate in there. Put some chocolate in the bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. What else do we need with our cookies? Poor building activity that they made up. <laughs> we need something to make the cookies rise. Uh, spoon. Spoon. We, spoon. we need something to make the cookies rise. A spoon. Oh well, okay, let's go with a spoon. Oh, That's fine. Now, Chocolate cookie dough. Now the cookies all done. Now they're all done. Uh, well, time for a cookie dough shower. Yeah. So now I'm gonna get you wet. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Ready? I will, he says, I will copy my eyes. I don't think he would have let him do that if they hadn't made the cookies first. <laughs> Your turn. Okay, my turn. Ready? Watching me. So that is beautiful. So he says, okay, now we're going to go back to shoulders in the water and wash off the cookie dough. There we go. This kid was so tuned in to the visual schedule. What are we doing next? What's next? I want to do that before. Okay, I will try one, two, two three. Yeah. I love how he counts himself in. Okay, I'm willing to try this. It's on the schedule. Really quick, bam. <laughs> you got cookie dough in your hair. We're going to wash it out. We're putting our hair in the water. much way beyond the universe of rapport building activity I had in mind, but I really, really liked it. The kid loved it. So there he is away from the 
side of the pool. Blowing bubbles. So he tries to do this funny high five thing. The kid's like, whatever, what are we doing next? I want to know what's on the schedule. What's next? What's next? to go on the mat. So you remember with the frogs before, where he was trying to get him, like, sunk it, then modeled going under the water, and the kid was terrified. So we had these uh, dinosaur puppets that, for this kid, were the motivator to get him to put his head in the water. So we never explicitly talked about incorporating preferred activity or per, like reinforcing things in the context of the activity. A lot of the instructors did that though. They thought, yeah, I know, I know this kid, I know what he likes, I'm going to build it into what I'm doing. I also did not give them a lot of explicit instruction in how to shape behavior, but he recognized putting it at the bottom of the pool is way too hard for this kid. I'm going to put it on the platform, I'm going to hold it here so he can just reach a little bit. Swimming instructors are amazing at shaping behavior. They really get it. They get how to fade prompts. A lot of all that stuff is just, they already get it. So remember before in baseline, the kid is in the corner when he comes at him with the noodle and he basically starts crying when he tries to get him to come away from the wall. Now he's proud of himself. <laughs> They're kind of goofy little kicks, but still, it's better than nothing. Okay? So, and he would actually look up at his mom a lot and go, look at me, I'm kicking, right? Like, uh, for this kid, the... Um, the visual schedule was unbelievable, just in terms of we could show him the same activities, and because he, uh, he knew when they were coming, he knew what was coming next, there were um, lots of nice choices for him after he could manage to accomplish some of those harder tasks, um, he was way more willing to do things. He needed, needed, needed that predictability and structure, both the kids who we saw. So it's, it's not surprising to me at the end of the study that so many instructors made the comment um, you know, these visual supports are so helpful. Okay, so now we're going to look at some of the dyad data. We're going to use, um, we're going to look at some graphs and uh, we're using techniques from single subject research design here to evaluate uh, what we think about the results. So I was looking for the presence of what Horner describes as basic effects, meaning a change in the data. <laughs> following the manipulation of the independent variable. So translated meaning, after we did the intervention, did the data change, right? Not only did the data change though, we had a, I had a very strict criteria for what I was looking for. So I wanted, and these all again come out of the single subject uh, research literature, but I needed to see a change in the level, uh, it needed to be an immediate effect, uh, change in the trend of the data, uh, some change to the variability, so preferably a decrease in the variability, and if there was overlapping data between baseline and intervention, that's not so good. So if any of those things were not true, I said, we don't have an effect. So it was actually quite a conservative criteria to use when evaluating, you know, was there actually a change from baseline to intervention? It all comes down to looking at, if we had just extended the data from baseline, uh, what would we have seen later in the intervention phase. So I wanted to make sure that, yeah, it's great that at the end of the study the kid's doing better than he did at the beginning, but really you would expect for some kids that they just kept getting better. So 
I use this thing called the split metal, middle technique to really look at the trend of the data in baseline and then compare that uh, com if I was to extrapolate that into the intervention phase. So compare that what would have been expected against what we actually observed. Okay, so I think that'll be more clear here in a second. So here is a summary of the basic effects we saw in the study. So meeting that five, uh, that conservative uh, five, also all those five things had to be true. So remember I told you earlier that wait until ready and um, arm's length were already present at very high level during baseline. So I ended up calling those two acquired skills, meaning that they already had them, right? So I did not see basic effects for either of those two skills uh, for any of the instructors, meaning that there was no change. They were already using them in baseline, okay? So if we go dyad by dyad here, and remember, here's the instructor that thought three different kids, and there's her data separated for each child. These are the girls you saw in the video. So effect for instructor use of the skills, child cooperation on the first attempt and second attempt. The same was true for the boys you saw in the video. Uh, and for this instructor with this particular child, uh, the people in yellow had basic effect for the instructor's use of the five new skills and the child's cooperation on the first attempt, but not the second attempt, so that's still pretty good. Um, the rest of them had a basic effect somewhere, but not across more than one category. Okay, so a bit of a discussion here. So remember, right from the beginning, uh, previous research kind of looked like this. So you had these trained, specialized instructors, kind of graduate students usually, a lot of them did their studies in special pools, so either the university pool, like when no one else was there, or like therapeutic pools, whereas this was really a community pool with cold water. Uh, <laughs> can I just emphasize lots that? Of <laughs> lots of noise, other people there, normal, right? Just typical. Uh, and you know, those, that previous research really looked at these kind of more specific and technical procedures, like that constant time delay, for example. And this is what I tried to do with my study, was take it into the community, uh, have community instructors in the community pools, and look at really the impact of a training package. Uh, would that affect, would that impact instructor skills? And then in turn, if the instructors had more skills, how would that change uh, the child outcomes? Both, not only their swimming, number of swimming skills they've learned, but also just, I was really interested in just getting these kids engaged with the instruction, so cooperating more frequently. So there were a number of positive results with this study. It really is a, just a tiny stepping stone in the type of research that really needs to be done in this area. Um, so, but thinking about why this study may have been successful, with the training I tried to do a few different things. So not just stand up and give them information, but also to make it really hands-on, to do that modeling, to do the in-person coaching, to give the feedback in two different forms, um, that sort of thing. Uh, if we think back to you know, another thing that's really interesting about the study is remember, they learned the skills with a different child. So in the training phase, with the coaching they got from me, they worked with a different kid and then they were able to go back and apply those skills with the same kid they knew from baseline. So that's, a, that's actually really incredible generalization that they were able to get those types of outcomes. So thinking back to, you know, the classic article from Stokes and Bear in 1977 where they talk about technology for generalization, a couple of features of this study may have, you know, helped us to see those types of outcomes. So in the training phase, they did get to practice with a whole bunch of different examples. Same kid, same teacher, but different skills, right? Working on different skills with the kid, getting my feedback on how to coach different types of skills. A uh, whole bunch of different instructions coming out of their mouths. Uh, different schedules, so each day it would maybe look a little bit different. Um, they, get to, they got to experiment with different types of rapport building activities with their child that they had in the train group. Um, and, you know, between the training phase we did and the intervention, it was the same pool. They used the same visual support. So there were some common commonalities between those two settings, quite a few commonalities. I tried to match the train group kid with the swim group kid, but, you know, that was... <laughs> far from perfect. So many instructors were working with a boy in one and a girl in another, uh, different ages. I tried to match the age, but could, it was, you know, the biggest difference I think was um, two years, maybe three years between kids. Um, I really tried to match their language ability, uh, but still there were slight differences uh, for different instructors. So overall, I'm, I'm very pleased with how, how well they were able to generalize the skills with the kid from the swim group when they got them back in intervention. There are some threats to 
uh, internal and external validity that should be considered. Um, however, I think that the threats to internal validity that were possible in this study are unlikely. So um, history, you know, the study really took place over a relatively short period of time. Not too likely that a whole bunch of other things might have accounted for the changes that we saw. Same with maturation, short period of time. Instrumentation was kept consistent throughout the study, so I don't think that would have accounted for the results. Um, although this is really a small study and just a little tiny stepping stone there, uh, and you know we only had the eight kids involved, it still has some features that contribute to its external validity. So there were, they were a diverse group of kids. So um, from varying racial and ethnic backgrounds, uh, boys and girls both, different uh, language abilities, from kids who you know barely spoke at all, like maximum three word phrase kind of thing, to uh, kids who spoke fluently in full sentences participated in this research. So quite a bit of diversity. And a little bit of diversity in terms of swimming ability. Mostly a lot of kids who couldn't do anything and then one kid who could do a few more things. Uh, a bit of diversity even within the group of instructors. So they ranged from uh, about 20 to 30, so a 10 year span. Uh, they had di all kinds of different educational backgrounds from like chef school. Uh, one had, one was in university, I can't remember what he's doing. Sociology or... Anthropology, yeah, you would know. Anthropology, uh, one of them was actually in a program to become an SCA, so a special education assistant, so had a bit more background, but she was the only one who had that kind of, any type of exposure, really. Uh, several of the instructors had taught kids with autism, they, or they thought they had taught kids with autism, after I told them a little bit what, what autism is. Um, but never, again, never received any help or support really around how to do that. Uh, and initial skill profile. So some of the instructors were pretty good at giving clear instructions even in baseline. So the instructor who worked with the advanced kid was actually quite clear in her instruction even in the baseline phase, but not so good at prompting. She would try a lot of different things before she finally got to something that worked, um, and not so good at delivering feedback. Whereas we had other instruction, instructors who um, did not give clear instructions at all and you know gave a lot of praise you know so all different profiles of the seven skills and finally uh, so we had one-on-one -on -one lessons for most of the kids and then with that one little group three kids and one instructor um, as I mentioned earlier you know uh, we had these three sort of waves of people that went through the study the first wave was first and second waves were Monday to Friday lessons so back to back to back to back to back and that last wave that we had in the fall was uh, Saturday, so only once a week. So again, the fact that this training seemed to produce positive outcomes um, amongst all of these diverse variables is kind of promising that maybe, maybe it would be something that would be worth exploring more in the future with other groups of kids. Okay, so lots of uh, limitations as well that you need to be very aware of. So this is a quasi-experimental research design. It's an A-B design, A-B, 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 A-B. Um, so many limitations uh, associated with that. Small number of participants. Something that's very interesting to me is I don't know which of the seven skills really made the difference. This is a package. So maybe if they had only used the visual supports, who knows what kind of outcomes we would have For seen. Future research, as I said, like this is like throwing a little pebble into the giant ocean of what could be done here. So uh, we need research designs that allow for documentation of experimental control, which the study does not. Uh, we could do some component analysis, so look at which of the seven skills, you know, in these different variations, how does it work, what are the outcomes like. Uh, we could do some parametric analysis, so maybe increase or decrease the amount of coaching and see how that in turn relates to child outcomes. Uh, some follow-up measures would be terrific, not just for the instructors, it's both. It's the instructor's long-term learning and the children's long-term learning. So we don't know which of the, has the cooperation remained at the same level and what about their swimming skills, right? And finally, uh, there are certainly lots of kids who are participating in group lessons where either they're working with a one-on-one -on -one support person or not, right? So how would a training package like this work for, to support instructors who are you know, working with kids in, in group lessons? So many, many things still to do. Thanks for coming.